أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله we finally start with عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه uh, some people were starting to think it's, it was a conspiracy why are they waiting so long to get to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But again, to set the premise of the series, we have been talking about the first, meaning those who embraced Islam by order, speaking about the struggle as it was unfolding and the capacity of these companions in regards to their embracing Islam. And of course, with Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his Islam completely changes the course of history forever. So this is the most consequential conversion to Islam in the history of Islam after the Prophet ﷺ himself receiving revelation. The consequences of his shahada change the entire course. A page is turned in the seerah books of the Prophet ﷺ and we understand something new about this community that laid the foundation for us to benefit from until today. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, is the last of the four Khulafa al-Rashideen in terms of the order of embracing Islam and the last of the, you know, the prominent muhajireen, the prominent people of Mecca, prominent in regards to the seerah books, the names that are well known to us. When you look at the order of people embracing Islam, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the last of the group of muhajireen as we know them, who embraces Islam and who changes the way that Islam uh, functions in the world as a community of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, he is very beloved for good reason. And I'll say this SubhanAllah that the love that people have for Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it reminds me first and foremost of that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if Allah loves someone, he calls Jibreel alayhi salam and he says, Ya Jibreel, inni uhibbu fulan, O Jibreel, I love this person. So love this person. So Jibreel alayhi salam loves this person. And by the way, we'll see that in the initial conversion of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Jibreel loves the person. And Jibreel alayhi salam calls out to Ahl al to the inhabitants of the heavens and says that Allah loves this person. So love this person. So all of the inhabitants of the heavens love that person as well. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that to translate into the love of the righteous for that person on earth. The love that the Muslims have for Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is divine. It is something that Allah has put in our hearts that when we hear his name, there's a sense of pride, a sense of attachment. When you're reading any story of the seerah, as soon as you hear his name come in, you know that things are about to get interesting, right? You know that the, this part of the story is going to get interesting and you're ready to hear what's next. You read about the history of Umar radiallahu anhu, his khilafah, the system that he established, the justice of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And it is nothing but love that comes in the hearts of the Muslims. So let's talk about him. And I know that many of us have heard the story of his conversion. And I want to emphasize from the start, inshallah ta'ala, that if you go back and look at some of the biographies that we covered of people that maybe were not as well known to you, we will start to connect a few more dots inshallah and we'll talk about some points of context that aren't typically mentioned in a lecture about the conversion of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So there will be tidbits that I want you to hang on to and hopefully this will force you to go back and watch some of the lectures that it may have been some time uh, you know, of people that we cover and their stories are deeply interconnected with, with Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So his name is Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufayl ibn Abdul Uzza. And right away when you hear Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufayl, we covered someone early on in the series whose name is connected to that. Who do you hear? Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. One of the first people that we covered in this series was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the man who the Prophet sallallahu said, when we come on the day of judgment, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those lined up behind our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we see the nations lined up behind their prophets, this man will be standing alone because he believed and he acted upon his belief before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received revelation and he was persecuted for that. So basically, he had the journey of a Sahabi without ever getting to be a real Sahabi 
because he did not live to see the Prophet ﷺ receive revelation. This is the cousin of, of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his first cousin. In fact, and as we know, his greatest persecutor was the father of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Al-Khattab. So Al-Khattab was the one that would beat Zayd when Zayd would speak in front of the Kaaba about following the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam and about the importance of monotheism. Al-Khattab said, get this out of here. Why? This is distracting Quraysh. This is harming our idols. This is an insult to our culture. It's an insult to our forefathers. And he would be the one that would beat Zayd so much that Zayd could no longer bear to come out and live in Mecca. So the father of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is Al-Khattab ibn Nufayl, the uncle of Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Now Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is from Banu Adi. And that's the father's tribe. And Banu Adi is a small tribe, sub-tribe of Quraysh. So they are Qurashi, but they're not one of the large tribes, a very small tribe uh, from Quraysh. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, just to describe him physically, what do you think when you hear the name of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu? Strength, big and strong, right? So big that when he would ride on an animal, his feet would touch the ground. Uh, sometimes because of how strong he was, how big he was, so big that when he walked on the road, the kids would run away because they would be afraid of him even if he meant no harm. Um, everything about him represents a Paul Bunyan-like physical stature, right? Someone who was just absolutely huge. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala and his physical description, extremely tall, very strong, okay? Uh, he had a reddish skin color meaning he was fair-skinned. He had a, a, a white color with a reddish hint to it. But then you'll find sometimes he's described as the opposite. And they say because in the year of the famine, Umar radiallahu anhu abstained from food. And because of his abstaining, particularly from meat, that he actually uh, changed colors. SubhanAllah, you actually find that his color changed in the midst of that, uh, that period of his life. So he's described as both. He had uh, very big, deep-set eyes, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So you looked at his eyes and they were very big and they were deep-set. Uh, they, they stood out uh, from his facial, from his facial uh, features. Large uh, uh, hands, uh, large feet, a deep voice. One of the funny narrations that I came across is that one time, and Imam al-Qurtubi rahimullah has a narration, that one time someone, there was a barber that was cutting Umar's hair. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu just spoke to tell him something and he fainted because he got afraid because of how deep the voice of Umar was. So the depth of the voice of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was that you could hear him from far away, far away and his voice would echo from its depth. So he had a deep, deep voice uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The ground under him would tremble. His, his voice would cause the environment around him uh, to tremble. And this is a, you know, something that is not looked down upon in the deen. When you look at Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his strength, and this is of course from the beauty of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is that he put everyone on a track when they became Muslim that fit their strengths. And that was for their benefit and for the benefit of the community. He would not try to tame Umar radiallahu anhu when he became Muslim, but he directed Umar's ang his, his energy and his strength towards that which was righteous and that which was good. And there's a narration here from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha about the character of the deen in that sense. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, one time, our mother Aisha saw a group of men walking very slow, you know, bent over, bad posture like me, right? Just kind of like walking like this. And uh, Aisha radiallahu anha said, what's going on with these guys? What is it with them? They said, Ya Um, ya, ya um al-Mu'mineen, they're Zuhad, Qurra. One narration Zuhad, one says Qurra. So they're ascetics, they're people who have abstained from the dunya. They are reciters, Qurra, meaning they recite at night. They recite all night, they don't sleep at night. So, mashallah, they don't eat, they don't drink, they're very weak, they're very pious, they're very humble. And Aisha radiallahu anha's response was, La tumitu alayna dinina. Don't, you know, don't, don't do this to our religion. Don't, don't kill our deen for us. Don't bring this type of behavior to our deen. And she said, Rahimallahu Umar. May Allah have mercy on Umar. Laqad kana Umar Sayyid al-Qurra. He was the, the master of all of those who would recite at night. No one prayed Qiyam more than Umar. No one was more humble than Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Wa kana idha masha asra. When he walked, he walked fast. 
Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you would not know from his piety and his asceticism, you wouldn't see him walking like, why are you walking so slow? You know, my back hurts. I've been praying qiyam all night. It's been, it's been rough with all the tahajjud. You know, my knees hurt from tahajjud. No, Umar radiallahu anhu would walk very fast. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And she said, وَإِذَا تَكَلَّمَ أَسْمَعَ When he spoke, he made sure everyone heard him. He didn't have a low voice. He wasn't arrogant, but his voice was confidence. That's who he was radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That was the character of Deen in Umar radiallahu anhu. When he spoke, he spoke authoritatively. He was not afraid radiallahu ta'ala anhu to project his voice. وَإِذَا ضَرَبَ أَوْجَعَ And when he hit, he hit hard. <laughs> there was no weakness in the punch or the hit of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Islam did not do away with any of that with Umar, but now when he walked, he did not walk with personal pride. He walked out of the confidence and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he spoke in one narration when he fed, he fed generously, right? He didn't hold back anything radiallahu ta'ala anhu of his, uh, of his uh, wealth when he spent for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we move on. Umar radiallahu anhu's age is significant. Because when you think of the Islam of Umar, you think of an older person, right? One of the, the leaders of Quraysh in terms of his, uh, his status. And the reality is, is that he was in his mid-twenties. Okay, so he was about 24 years old when the Prophet ﷺ received revelation, even down to 21 years old. And when we're looking at some of these Sahaba that embraced Islam at 17, 18, 19 years old, Umar ta'ala anhu was in his early twenties. Uh, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a camel herder for his father and a trader as well. So we said he was born in Mecca. And Banu Adi, uh, despite being a small clan, they used to participate in some of the arbitration and some of the, uh, the, the, the reparations when there were issues amongst the different tribes of Quraysh. His mother, her name was Hamtama bint Hisham. Hamtama bint Hisham. And she was from the tribe of Banu Makhzum which is the tribe of Abu Jahl, the tribe of Abu Jahl, the tribe of Khalid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this is significant because uh, Hamtama was the niece of Abu Jahl. So Abu Jahl was actually Umar's uncle, okay? And he would refer to him as such, and Abu Jahl would refer to him as his nephew because of his mother. So he's got his foot in both of these tribes in Banu Adi, small but powerful, not necessarily influential, respected, they kind of have their space carved out and then his, his foot as well in the door when it comes to Banu Makhzum. Now, his father was uh, known for one thing and one thing only, which is very significant. Harshness. Extremely harsh man. Ruthless. He was ruthless with his family. He was ruthless with the strangers. He was ruthless with everybody around him. And this shows up in multiple narrations. First and foremost, from Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu himself, Sa'id ibn Musayyib radiallahu anhu said that Umar radiallahu anhu used to come to the valley, a valley on the outskirts of Mecca, and he would look out and he would say, La ilaha illallah al azim al ali al mu'ti ma sha'a man sha'a. Said, you know, La ilaha illallah, the Most High, exalting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who gives to whom he wills, when he wills. And he said, I remember when I used to work in these valleys and herd sheep and camels for my father and for my uncles and for my aunts. And my father, My father was, was so rough, he was ruthless. He would exhaust me if I did my work right and he would beat me if I did my work wrong. And he says, you know, in, in different narrations, he says that um, my father used to, used to overwork me and he used to be an abusive man with his tongue and with his hands. SubhanAllah, uh, another narration from Abdurrahman ibn Hatib, he said that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned that he would make me herd the sheep and he would make me gather the firewood. But every time he mentions Al-Khattab, he mentions he was an abusive man. So Umar radiallahu anhu grew up with a, with, with a hatred of sorts for his father because his father used to beat him severely. And he used to beat others as we see. So he was known for his roughness, his harshness, and this was something that he himself experienced first, and this was something that, that Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, of course, experienced as well. Now, uh, what we keep on hearing though, is that Umar radiallahu anhu also took from this a sense of humility that I was just someone that used to herd sheep and camels. And so there are so many different narrations 
of Umar radiallahu anhu reflecting on his time as a sheep herder and as a camel uh, herder. And, uh, you know, we take first and foremost that you don't need to be resigned to the weaknesses of your parents or circumstances. Umar radiallahu anhu could have easily been a cruel man for the rest of his life and justified that by saying, what, my father was cruel with me. I grew up in cruel circumstances. Instead, we'll see Umar radiallahu anhu take a, a, a particular affinity towards al-adl, towards justice. He did not want to inherit the cruelty of his father in that sense. So when Umar radiallahu anhu would show his anger, especially after Islam, it was injustice and it was for righteous causes and it did not transgress into zulm, uh, into oppression. However, when it comes to his being a shepherd, multiple times where Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would call to attention that he used to just be a shepherd to himself and to his society. And this is throughout Islam. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that one time, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he uh, stood up on the member and he said, call the adhan. This is when he was the khalifa. Now, when you call the adhan outside of salah time, what does that indicate? Maybe war, we're under siege, an army has come. It's something extremely important. So there's something that requires us to call the adhan now, call the people to prayer now. So they all gather to hear what Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu has to say. He said, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. So he started off in the name of Allah and with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, my name is Umar. I used to be called Umair, which is little Umar. And I used to be a barefoot shepherd that would tend to the sheep of my father and of my aunts from Banu Makhzum. And they would give me just a handful of dates that would suffice me for the day. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. He just gets down. Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu said, I went to him and I said, did you really just call all the people for this? And Umar radiallahu anhu said, Ya Abdurrahman, I noticed something in myself. I was receiving the amwal, the wealth coming from all over the world because Islam had spread under Umar radiallahu anhu and my nafs, myself spoke to me and said, look at you. MashaAllah, self-talk, right? You're Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers. You are this, you are that. So he said, I wanted to teach my nafs a lesson. <laughs> so this was me talking down my nafs, putting my nafs back in its place. Another narration, Khawla bint Tha'laba. Remember we talked about last week, Khawla bint Hakim versus Khawla bint Tha'laba. A woman, an elderly woman in the streets of Mecca or Medina at that time, and she calls out to Umar and she says, Ya Umair, he's the leader of the, the, the Muslims. She says, Ya Umair, little Umar, I remember when you used to be barefoot and tending to the sheep and to the shepherds and to the, to the camels as a shepherd in Mecca, in the valleys of Mecca. So fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those who are now under your care. And Umar radiallahu anhu would break down crying. And they said to this old woman, they said, you know, calm down. Why are you doing this to Amir al-Mu'mineen? And they're, they're both trying to calm her down and they're telling Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, why are you so moved by this elderly woman? Why don't you just tell her to stop? Why don't you send her away? Why are you so humbled when she speaks? He says, you know who that is? That is the woman who Allah heard from above seven heavens, Al-Mujadila, the woman who came pleading to the Prophet Wasallam. If Allah heard her above seven heavens, you want me to not hear her? So he was always humbled by his background, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And one specific thing, and then I'll move on from this inshallah ta'ala. He says that he used to tend to the sheep of his aunts from Al-Makhzum as well. So it wasn't just his father but also his aunts from Al-Makhzum, which was the tribe of, as we said, Abu Jahl. And of course, a gem of this that the scholars mention is that the prophets were shepherds. The Prophet ﷺ said that all of the prophets were shepherds and that there are certain leadership qualities that come out of being a shepherd, right? Caring for the flock. So Umar anhu had that experience as a young man growing up of taking care of the flock. And that is very much needed when you become in charge of a group of people to know how to take care of the flock because uh, people are very much so like the flock, right? They, they, they go with the flow and you have to, you know, care for them and be tender with them and bring them along and make sure that you exhibit the right behavior to keep them together and to protect them from their outside enemies. So anyway, that is his uh, profession as a young man. Now, what he did as he grew up was he started to supplement his income through different ways. One of them is that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would enter into wrestling competitions. So he used to fight and he would enter into the wrestling competitions of his time. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was known to not lose any type of battle. So he was known for his strength 
and uh, he would overcome people in, 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 in fighting, in wrestling, and he would earn money in that way. Another thing that Umar anhu did, which is significant, is that he learned how to read and write in his teenage years, which was very rare amongst Quraysh. You know, sometimes you think about Umar radiallahu anhu, you think maybe, you know, someone who's brute, who's, who's, you know, ignorant, kind of impulsive, doesn't have, you know, high intelligence. That's kind of the portrayal, right, of a person who jumps and... No, Umar radiallahu anhu was extremely intelligent, very, very learned, smart, and he was only amongst, they said, amongst 17 people from Quraysh that had embraced Islam that knew how to read. He knew poetry, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he developed a, an understanding of the poetry at the time. And guess what? Because of just how competitive he was, what did Umar radiallahu anhu do at a young man? He basically entered into the diss battles of his time, which means that he would use poetry to insult people and they would insult back and he would basically poet, out poetry you and defeat you in poetry, and he'd make money off of that too. So he would out-wrestle, he would out-poetry you. He knew how to defeat you with his strength and with his speech, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He just knew how to overcome people in every way. The only thing that he was not so successful at was being a merchant, buying and selling. They said he wasn't the best merchant. He did go out on trade routes. He went to Rome and he went to Persia, by the way as a kid. So he went out and he saw the world عنه, in the various trade routes, but he wasn't necessarily uh, successful in his trade. So what does he, what does he uh, attain amongst Quraysh as well with his skill set? He was known as, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah says, the Safir of Quraysh. He was the ambassador of Quraysh. He would defend Quraysh against everyone else. How? When there was any type of poetry, when there was any type of competition amongst the tribes, when the outsiders came to Mecca, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was basically the flag bearer of Quraysh. He would go out and he would boast about Quraysh's superiority over everybody else. Most people would boast about the superiority of their specific tribes. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would defend all of Quraysh and all of Quraysh saw him as their spokesperson to address the outsider or the insider about the superiority of Quraysh. And of course, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu combines both being intelligent and intimidating, right? So he combined the two things that would be necessary for that role and everybody loved him as a result of that. Now let's continue onwards inshallah ta'ala, some of the context when we come into Islam. We said that his uncle is Abu Jahl. His mother's tribe is Banu Makhzum, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu would also play a role in some of the harassment of the early Muslims. He just really didn't like Islam. He did not like the Prophet Sallallahu message. He did not like what he saw as a disruption to society being together. Now, there's something really important here about Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that distinguishes him from Abu Jahl in this regard. Abu Jahl, feared for losing his edge or losing the edge of the tribe, that the tribe would lose some ground, Banu Makhzum would lose some ground to Banu Hashim. Banu Makhzum, being a sub-tribe, had to maintain superiority in Mecca. And that's why he didn't want to give the Prophet ﷺ any type of room to breathe or to preach. He did not want Banu Hashim to gain leverage over Banu Makhzum. Umar anhu did not care about his tribe, he cared about his people as a whole. He cared about society as a whole. And so this is something that might be a little bit hard for some of us to appreciate on a first reading of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that his objection to Islam actually came from a pretty noble place. It was not ego. It was not, well, he's the child of this person and I'm the child of that person. It was, this person is dividing our families. This person is weakening us as a society because of all of the division that's being caused. And because of that, our enemies are making a mockery of us, our idols are insulted, our forefathers are insulted. Realize when he used to defend Quraysh, he had to defend all of their culture, all of their religious practices, everything. And here Muhammad Wasallam's message is splitting them apart. So he did not like the disruptiveness of Islam more than anything else. What is this that has come between us as tribes in Mecca and is disrupting us? And that was the source of his persecution, okay, of the Muslims, which is very different from Abu Jahl, who acts from a place of pure ego, and that I should be the one in charge, and if we had a prophet, he should be from Banu Makhzum, 
and we can never give Benu Hashem any leverage over us. And so I'm going to turn all of society against these people and torture them so that my tribe can have superiority. There's a difference between the two motivations in that regard. However, at the end of the day, the two biggest people in Mecca from a size perspective were Abu Jahl and Umar and they are persecuting the Muslims. Umar, not so much as Abu Jahl, but still he is amongst the persecutors. Now before Umar even embraces Islam, from his family, we know that his sister, Fatima bint al-Khattab, embraced Islam. Fatima bint al-Khattab embraced Islam, and she was the wife of Sa'id ibn Zayd. May Allah be pleased with them both. All right, so Fatima precedes him in Islam. We have a feeling that his wife, whose name we mentioned last week, anyone remember? Zainab bint Mad'oon, the sister of Uthman ibn Mad'oon, Zainab bint Mad'oon, we have a feeling that she also embraced Islam prior to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in secret. So Fatima did not tell Umar radiallahu anhu that she embraced Islam. Zainab, had she embraced Islam, did not tell Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that she embraced Islam. And then there is an older brother of Umar. This is a very interesting man, subhanAllah. Zayd ibn al-Khattab. Zayd ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was the older brother of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But his personality, very quiet, very much isolated from society. SubhanAllah, sometimes you look at your kids and it's like, how, did, how are they brother and sister, right? They have such different personalities. Zayd was very quiet, not very involved in the affairs of Quraysh, but Islam appealed to him right away. And he embraced Islam and he embraced it secretly, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the only thing we know about Zayd is his embracing Islam and then his death. SubhanAllah, nothing in between. Like he embraced Islam quietly, stayed around the Prophet ﷺ. He, he is from amongst the first, even before Umar anhu. But we can't do a biography about him because there's so little about him. Zayd anhu was also very tall, like Umar anhu, And, uh, you know, someone that, that could have been very in, influential in society, but did not take that role. And he surpassed Umar in Islam and he surpassed Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in shahada, in martyrdom. Zayd died in the battle of Yamama against Musaylam al-Kadhab. He was martyred fighting against Musaylam al-Kadhab. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who of course fought in that battle alongside Zayd, he came to Zayd at the, at the battlefield and there was a strong scent of musk from the body of Zayd. The wind was blowing and you just smelled the musk from his body. The martyr, Zayd. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Rahimak Allah, Ya Zayd, may Allah have mercy upon you, O Zayd. Sabaqtani marratain, you, you beat me twice. Sabaqtani ila al-Islam wa sabaqtani ila shahada You beat me to Islam and then you beat me to martyrdom. SubhanAllah, what a man. You know, this is Umar's brother. Don't hear much about him in the background, but he preceded Umar to Islam. And he preceded Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to shahada. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when the wind used to blow, he used to say, I can still smell the, the scent of Zayd. Like the wind would remind him of the musk from the, from, from the body of his brother who died shaheed in the battle of Yamama. So those are, that is his, his brother, that is his sister, that both embraced Islam before him. Now let's talk about his marriages really quick. We mentioned Zaynab bint Mad'oon who was the mother of Abdullah ibn Umar and the mother of Hafsa. May Allah be pleased with them. So an amazing woman um, to have raised those kids. All right. Uh, he also would, would marry at some point Atika bint Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayr. So he married the daughter of uh, Zayd ibn Amr, who is also the sister of Sa'id ibn Zayd. He also would marry at some point Umm Kulthum bint Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib the granddaughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he married her because he wanted a connection to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He wanted to have that, uh, that shared lineage of Ahlul Bayt with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that regard. And he also married uh, Umm Hakim bint Al-Harith, Umm Hakim bint Al-Harith radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was the widow of Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ikrama, of course, the son of Abu Jahl would become Muslim and would die as a martyr. When he was martyred, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, married his, uh, his widow as well. So these are some of the spouses of Umar uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu throughout his life. So what's the story of him becoming Muslim? 
Some of this you've heard, I'm sure some of it you have not, but let's sort of break it down. How Allah was putting Islam in front of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu time and time and time again, and how he was different, how he was different. The first narration is from a woman by the name of Umm Abdullah bint Abi Hathma. Umm Abdullah bint Abi Hathma radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was one of the persecuted Muslims. And she was one of those who escaped with her husband to Habasha, to Abyssinia, because of the harshness of the persecution. And Umm Abdullah, uh, she describes this incident. She says that we used to be, you know, abused by Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in society. And he was amongst those who were harshest on us for being Muslim. And then one day, uh, me and my husband, we were getting ready to go to Abyssinia. Amr, my husband, left to go do something and I was the only one in front of my house and I was getting our luggage ready so that we could make the migration. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he rides by and he looks to me and he says, Ila aina ya Umm Abdullah? Where are you going, Umm Abdullah? So she said, I responded in anger to him. Right, like, you know what? I'm sick of you. We've, we've had enough of you. So she said to him that, we are searching throughout Ardillah, throughout the land of Allah, so that we will no longer be harmed for worshiping Allah. Because you and your people have made it too hard for us to live in this land. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was hurt. <laughs> and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he puts his head down and he says, Sahibakumullah, may Allah be with you and your husband. And he rides off. That was not the answer she was expecting. She was expecting Umar radiallahu anhu to throw a curse word back, maybe hit her, spit in her direction. That was not what she was expecting from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So she said, he looked hurt. I saw a riqqa, this, these are her words, a riqqa, a softness from him that I never saw before. I never saw the softness from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Amr came home and I said to him, لَوْ رَأَيْتَ عُمَرْ وَرِقَّتَهُ وَحُزْنَهُ عَلَيْنَا You should have seen Umar his softness and his sadness for us when I told him that we are leaving. So she said, Amr looked at me, my husband looked at me and said, Ibn al-Khattab, like let's make sure we're talking about the, the same Umar here. Ibn al-Khattab? I said, yeah, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he laughed and he said, so you think he's going to become Muslim? And Umar Abdullah said, yeah, maybe. And he was the one that said the famous words, the himar of al-Khattab, the donkey of al-Khattab will become Muslim before Umar radiallahu anhu. Subhanallah, the donkey of his father will become Muslim before him. You have hope in him? Are you crazy? Right? Subhanallah, I mean, and, and if that's not a lesson in never X someone out, pass a judgment on them that they're done, as long as their soul is still in their body, you never know who's going to embrace Islam, you never know who has hope. This is the story. This man, who's a noble Sahabi, one of the, the, those that migrated to Habasha, thought, Umar, yeah, right. No way, there's no chance. He has no redeeming quality. He's harsh, he's rude, he's abusive. No good in Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And here we are talking about Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu today, one of the greatest Muslims to ever walk the face of the earth. So that's the first thing. The second one is an incident that's not as well known. And it's in Al-Bukhari. That Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and I'm going to the, the second half of this narration. He mentions, بَيْنَمَا أَنَا عِنْدَ آلِهَتِهِمْ إِذْ جَاءَ رَجْلٌ بِعِجَلٍ فَذَبَحَ uh, He says that I was once in front of the Kaaba, and a man brought his, uh, brought his animal and dabahahu, he, he slaughtered his animal. فَصَرَخَ بِهِ صَارِخٌ So he was sacrificing to the idols. And he said, then a, 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 a person or some being that we could not see, an unseen being, screamed at him. لَمْ أَسْمَعْ صَارِخًا قَطْ أَشَدَّ صَوْتًا مِنْهُ I've never heard a, a, a scream as loud as the shout at that man. So Umar radiallahu anhu is in front of the Kaaba. And he's watching this man come to sacrifice an animal to an idol. And he hears a voice yelling at that man. يَقُولُ يَا جَلِيحْ أَمْرٌ نَجِيحْ رَجُلٌ فَصِيحْ يَقُولُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتِ He said, interesting, subhanAllah. 
Uh, the words mean, Ya Jalih, you know, you wicked doer. Amrun Najih, an affair has risen amongst you that will be successful. Rajrun Fasih, an eloquent man amongst you who says, La ilaha illa ant, saying, None has the right to be worshipped but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fawathab al qawmu, faqultu, La abrahu hatta a'lama ma wara ahada. So he says that those that were around, they basically got up and ran away. They were shocked by what they just heard. He said, except for me. He said, I stood there and I said, I'm going to see where that voice came from. I want to know what just happened. So he said, another time, the voice came out and called out, Ya Jalih Amrun Najih Rajulun Fasih Yaqulu La Ilaha Illa Illa Allah. He said that the same thing was said. He said that it happened a third time. And he said, so I stood up. And when I stood up, I heard a few days later that a man has come out amongst us claiming prophethood. So he said this was a few days before the Prophet Sallallahu claimed prophethood that this incident happened around the Kaaba. And he said, I witnessed that incident as a young man. I didn't make much of it. One of those things I just passed off and I did not want to know what happened. Now the third narration, which is uh, the most interesting of them all, it's my favorite narration about the psychology of Umar anhu as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting Islam in front of him where he cannot deny what is happening in front of him. Umar anhu says that I was far away from Islam. I didn't really care for religion. I was driving people away from it. I really had no interest in this deen whatsoever. And he said, and I was addicted to drinking. I used to love to drink. SubhanAllah, just like Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his weakness in jahiliyyah, his weakness in the days of ignorance, he used to drink a lot. He used to drink a lot. So he said, I used to love to drink and I would gather with people who would drink alcohol. So his social gatherings, his hanging out at night was people that would get together and they would drink khamar. So he said, one night I went out, he's 25 years old by the way, all right, when this is happening, 25 to 27 years old. Again, don't think Umar radiallahu anhu, 50 year old, 60 year old, no, he's much younger than the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and some of the others in that ranking. Young man, he said, so one night I went out and I couldn't find any of my drinking buddies. There was no one around to drink. So he said, I went to one person who I know could make the khaman and I thought maybe, maybe he'll figure this out. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll have something for me. And I went to him and he had none with him. So I basically didn't have my drinking buddies, nor did I have anything to drink. So he said, I said to myself, I guess I'll go to the Kaaba and make the off. <laughs> Right, so it's sort of like religion as a last option. Let me go keep myself busy. Back then, that was sort of, you know, something that they would do around the idols. Eh, you know what, let me go make the laugh. So he said it was late at night. I couldn't find anyone to drink with. He was sober, which was not his normal state. And I went to the Kaaba to make the laugh, and I saw the Prophet ﷺ standing by himself, praying in front of the Kaaba. SubhanAllah, the incident. Look how, look how specific this is. He said that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray towards what? What was his qibla? Al-Aqsa. So he was praying towards Asham. He was praying towards Jerusalem. And he would put the Kaaba between him and Al-Aqsa. So he wasn't actually praying to the Kaaba, ﷺ, right? Or in the direction of the Kaaba. He was really praying in the direction of Al-Aqsa. But the Prophet ﷺ would situate himself at that time where the Kaaba was between him and Al-Aqsa, so he was praying towards both Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, and he was standing right between Al-Rukn Al-Yamani and Al-Rukn Al-Aswad. So the, the Yemeni corner and the black stone. So he's giving you the exact details of where he was standing uh, in front of the Kaaba. And the Prophet Sallallahu was there and he was standing right in front of the Kaaba. Okay, so he's not far back from it. He's right in front of it and no one else was around. It's late at night. This was kind of a strange scene to see the Prophet ﷺ out there at this time. No one was with him. So subhanAllah, in this moment, imagine it's just Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu and the Prophet ﷺ. He could have killed him and he could have hid that he killed him, right? Hid the evidence. He could have done something at that time. He could have attacked the Prophet ﷺ. Something could have happened. But Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he tries something else. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, you know what? لو أني, أس... لو أني استمعت لمحمد الليلة حتى أسمع ما يقول. He said, you know what? Let me listen to him tonight. 
Let me get an idea of what he's actually saying. Because up until now, you never really heard him read Quran. He didn't really care for anything the Prophet ﷺ was actually uh, saying or what his message uh, was about. He said, let me go and listen to him and see what he's saying. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, so I went to the opposite side of the Kaaba. All right, think about the Kaaba now. I went to the opposite side. He said, and I entered myself under its thiyab, so under the cloth of the Kaaba. And he said, I started to go around the Kaaba, right, under the cloth, until he said, I was right in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, تَحْتَ ثِيَابِهَا Under the thiyab, under the, the, the cloth of the Kaaba, and he's giving you the incident, he says, مَا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَهُ إِلَّا ثِيَابُ الْكَعْبَ The only thing between me and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was just the cloth of the Kaaba. SubhanAllah, what an incident. So I'm standing in front of him, hiding under the cloth of the Kaaba, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reciting Quran, so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, so I started to listen to him for some time. And he said, it started to, to get to my heart, and I thought to myself, I've never heard anything more beautiful than this. Can you imagine just you and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in front of the Kaaba, by the way? Imagine what it was like to be in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi him reading the Quran by himself in front of the Kaaba. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is standing there and he's saying, oh my God, this is beautiful. I've never heard anything so beautiful. And then he's talking to himself. He says, فَقُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِي I said to myself, هَذَا وَاللَّهِ شَاعِرٌ كَمَا قَالَتْ قُرَيْشِ He said, this man is truly a poet, the way Quraysh says about him. Because Umar radiallahu anhu was a literate man. He appreciated Right? Compositions and poetry and words. He says, what a poet this man is. Like, I'm just appreciating right now his poetry. He says, then the Prophet ﷺ was reciting Surah Al-Haqqa. And immediately, as soon as I thought that, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ قَلِيلًا ما تُؤْمِنُونَ SubhanAllah, it was like he was reading his mind. Immediately the words came from the Prophet ﷺ, he just happened to be reading Surah Al-Haqqa, that this is but the words of a noble messenger, and these are not the words of a poet. Little do you believe. Answer the objection of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, I said to myself, Kahin, Ali mafi nafsi, a sorcerer. He knows what's going through my head right now. What are the next words? وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ And these are not the words of a soothsayer or a sorcerer. Little do you remember. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, so I was shocked. Umar radiallahu anhu said, let me get out of here. <laughs> so he got out of that situation. He even mentions how like he got sick for some time. Like he was so shocked by the incident that happened between him and the Prophet ﷺ, like he couldn't make sense of what happened. Now he could have gone to the Prophet ﷺ and said, you know what, I'm ready to be Muslim now. But instead, he's confused, he's lost. Believing in Islam would mean undoing his entire reputation in society and everything that he's known for, right? The strong guy that keeps society together, that advocates for Quraysh, that all, all of these different things. This would ruin it all for him. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that I was really conflicted, confused. He said Islam had entered his heart, but at the same time, he was still fighting with it, right? He's fighting with it on the inside. So then he said, I went out and Abu Jahl was addressing the leaders of Quraysh. And Abu Jahl said, Ya ma'ashar of Quraysh, O leaders of Quraysh, who will kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa for us? He's divided our tribes. He has insulted our idols. And whoever kills him will have a hundred red camels from me and all the gold and silver that they can imagine. Now, why did Abu Jahl do this? Some of the context that we'll learn in the story is that this could have been because the Islam of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu already had sort of started the new page in the seerah that really, that really scared these leaders of Quraysh. Because Hamza radiallahu anhu becoming Muslim was a game changer already. And so now we really have to kill him because we're afraid at this point, if we don't, now that Hamza has embraced Islam, there's a new class of people that might embrace Islam. But in any case, we don't know that for sure. What we do know is that Umar radiallahu anhu said, you know what, ana laha, I'm gonna do it. So he said to Abu Jahl, my uncle, I've got it. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 
He pulls out his sword and he starts to march towards the Prophet ﷺ's house. And they said that Umar was walking briskly. He's not even trying to hide his intentions. His sword is like out. You could see him angry. And he's saying as he is walking, وَيْحَ مُحَمَّدًا مَا أَحْدَثَ فِينَا Woe to Muhammad وسلم, for what he has done to us, what he brought to us. تَعُودُ مَكَّةً إِلَى مَا كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ I'm going to make sure Mecca goes back to the way it used to be, right? This is not about arrogance, ego for him. This is, I'm sick of this disruption in society. It's messing with my head now. It's messed with Mecca. It's time to end this fitna. <laughs> That's how he's looking at it, right? I want to end this fitna in Mecca, this dissension in Mecca by just killing the Prophet وسلم, and getting it over with. Okay, so he's walking, he's storming, and there's a young man by the name of Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, and Nu'aym ibn Abdullah is also from Banu Adi, and he's also a secret Muslim. So he's from Umar's tribe, and he's also secretly a Muslim. And he sees Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu walking that way, and he says, Ila ayn ya ibn al-Khattab, where are you going, o ibn al-Khattab? You don't have that sword out for a small reason. You're clearly determined to go do something. And Umar radiallahu anhu says, I'm going to go kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and bring Mecca back to the way that it used to be. So now Nu'aym is really concerned. He's trying to think of a diversion. So first he tries to reason with Umar radiallahu anhu. He says, but what about the nobility of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Isn't he a sadiq al-ameen, a truthful one, a trustworthy one, who always did good for his people? He's not a bad man, right? Shouldn't we consider his character and the person that he is? And then Nu'aym, he says to him, and if that does not get to you, you've lost your mind, Ya Umar, if you think that Banu Abdul Man, Abdi Manaf, meaning the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu is gonna let you walk after you kill the Prophet Sallallahu At the end of the day, tribalism will come into play here. That's what brought Hamza out initially in the first place, right? That Banu Mahzum, Abu Jahl, insulted the Prophet Sallallahu It was tribalism at first, so he said, you think Banu Abdi Manaf is going to let you get away with killing Muhammad Sallallahu So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is looking at him and Umar is smart. And he says, could it be that you too have apostated? And when he's saying Saba, you've apostated, meaning from our ways, Mecca, Quraysh, right? And Nu'aym says, of course not. <laughs> you know, no, no, no. It's not that. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he points his sword towards him. And he says, لو أعلم ذلك لبدأت بك. He said, if I find out that you, you really are one of them, I'm actually going to kill you before I go kill him. And that's where Nu'aym says, أفلا أدلك على العجبي يا عمر? You want me to tell you something really amazing, O Umar? Now he's desperate. I'm trying to get him away from the Prophet ﷺ. He says, قد دخل عليك هذا الأمر في بيتك. You think I'm a problem? You're worried about me becoming Muslim? This affair has already reached your home. Umar radiallahu anhu says, who? From my house? Who? Nu'aym says to him, your sister Fatima and your brother-in-law Sa'id, they've become Muslim and they follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and his religion. So before you take care of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why don't you take care of your own family first? What's Nu'aym trying to do? He's trying to buy time to go run to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and hide the Prophet ﷺ away from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And in the process, he knows that Umar is a proud man. The only thing that's going to stop him is your, your own family, right? You're a hypocrite. You want to go handle the Prophet ﷺ? What about your own family? So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu turns around and he rushes to the house of Fatima bint al-Khattab, Sa'id bin Zayd. Nu'aym goes running to the Prophet ﷺ to tell the Prophet ﷺ what happened. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes towards the house of Fatima, his sister. When he gets to the door, he can hear humming, the Qur'an being recited. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu bangs on the door. And who was teaching his sister and his brother-in-law Qur'an? Does anyone know? I told you some of the old biographies will connect. Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Khabbab was there teaching Fatima and Sa'id the Qur'an. And he was the reciter in the house. Now Umar is Umar and Khabbab, come on, who's going to protect Khabbab? Right? Khabbab belongs to the most persecuted class in Mecca. So if Umar finds Khabbab, he's going to tear him to pieces at this point. Up until now, by the way, unlike Abu Jahl, Umar has never killed anyone. 
He's beaten, he's spit, he's cursed, he's been abusive, but he hasn't been to the viciousness of Abu Jahl. But this is a different moment. He's ready to kill the Prophet ﷺ, so he's going to kill whoever's in front of him, right? So Umar anhu, when he bangs on the door, Fatima, Saeed, Khabbab become very worried. Khabbab goes and he hides in the house somewhere and you know, uh, where, where Umar will not be able to find him. Fatima opens the door. Umar anhu bursts in and he says, what is it that I was hearing? They said, nothing. He said, no, no, I was hearing something being recited. I was hearing a humming. What was I hearing? They said, nothing. And he said, is it true that you have apostated? Sabahti, you've apostated and you followed Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Adu wa Tanafsiha, enemy of yourself. So he's speaking to his sister very harshly. Is it true? And Fatima's kind of frozen. She doesn't know how to answer Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu because Umar was extremely full of rage at this point. And Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu steps forward and he says, Ara'ayta ya Umar wa kana al haqqu fi ghayri deenik? So what would you say, O oh Umar, if the truth was in other than your religion? When Umar heard that from Sa'id, he pounced on Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he started to beat him and he started to abuse him, almost killing him. So he almost killed Sa'id ibn Zayd subhanAllah in these moments. Now, by the way, go back and watch the lecture on Sa'id ibn Zayd and you'll see the love and the respect that he had for him. But this is a moment. This is a different Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in these moments. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was sitting on the chest of Sa'id ibn Zayd. Sa'id was panting for breath and he's punching him blow after blow after blow after blow. And Fatima, tries to control Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and stop him. And when she does that, he, he moves his hand backwards and he, and he smacks her on the face and pushes her back, which caused her to start bleeding down her face and she starts to cry and she becomes obviously very emotional. And when that happens, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, uh, he looks at her and she says, يَا بْنَ الْخَطَّابِ مَا كُنْتَ صَانِعًا فَاصْنَعْ فَقَدْ أَسْلَمْتُ Oh, Ibn Khattab, do what you want to us, I became Muslim. Like, go ahead, do what you want from, to us, I became Muslim. And Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu responds under Umar ibn Khattab and says, قَدْ أَسْلَمْنَا وَآمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِي فَمَا كُنْتَ صَانِعًا فَاصْنَعْ We have become Muslim, we believe in Allah and His Messenger, whatever you're going to do to us, do. Go ahead and kill us. We're ready to be martyrs, we won't be the first martyrs. This is a post sumayya uh, world, a post family of Yasir world in this time, right? Where, you know what? We won't be the first people killed for our deen. Go ahead and kill us. Ma kunta sani'an fasna. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, looks at them and he says, Stahiyaytu ala nafsi. Like I was ashamed of myself. Seeing my sister with the blood running down her, her face, Umar radiallahu anhu was strong, but he wasn't a person who had no nobility. It's his own sister. So he said, I was ashamed of myself. So I got up off of Saeed and he looks at Saeed and he looks at Fatima and Saeed says to him that you're not going to be able to gather the people upon falsehood while the truth is other than what they claim. And Saeed is saying to him basically, look, do what you're going to do to us. And even if you kill us, you're not going to be able to gather the people. SubhanAllah, like he knows his motivation. If you're trying to hold Meccan society together, you're not going to hold them on falsehood. The truth is not with you, O Umar, it's not with your people. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he sat on the couch, sits down, tense moment. Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu was almost beaten to death. Fatima, his sister, is bleeding and crying. Khabab is hiding, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He's, he did not get into that at this point, right? Khabab would have been the first person killed in that moment, right? And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's, you know, Imagine the heavy breathing, the tears, the blood, the tension in the room. Umar radiallahu anhu sees the pages of the Qur'an in the corner. He says, uh, what is that? And they ignored his question. He said, bring it to me. And uh, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha responds and she's, she says to him, Lastam in ahliha. You're not from its people. You, it's not for you. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha, anhu he says to her, Wayhaki, qad waqa'a fi qalbi ma qulti. He said, listen, woe to you, uh, what you said has entered my heart. I'm listening to you right now. I'm not, I'm calm right now. Bring me that which you have 
انظر ما هذا الذي جاء به محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم let me look at what Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم has brought to you so Fatima said that we're afraid of what you're going to do with it he said لا تخافي don't worry I will you have my word I will give it to you exactly in the same way you give it to me I just want to read it and see what it is that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is teaching you so she saw some of the softness that Umm Abdullah saw in him on that day and she says to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, using a different tone, Ya akhi, oh my brother, innaka mushrik, you are a polytheist, wa innahu la yamasuhu illa al-mutahharun, and no one should touch this except for those who are pure, fa in kunta sadiqan, if you're true, if you're being truthful in what you're saying right now, that you're actually interested and that you're calm and you want to know what we have, faqum faqtasil, get up and do ghusl, go, go wash yourself the way that we wash ourselves when we read this Qur'an. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he gets out, he washes himself, he does the ghusl, he walks back into the house, he sits down, he says, now give it to me. Fatima brings him the, uh, the, the copy of the pages of the Qur'an. He stares at it and the first thing he reads is what? Actually, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That's the first thing. SubhanAllah, sometimes we skip the small things in the narration because we just take them for granted. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Quraysh used to say, Bismik Allahumma, in the name of Allah, in the name of God, but they didn't know the names of Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. That's why we, we see in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, Suhail ibn Amr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, at that time, not a Muslim, he objected to Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, right? So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, what beautiful names these are. He's calm right now, he's listening, and he's just appreciating. He says, these are beautiful names, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And then he starts to read. And imagine Umar's first recitation of the Qur'an. Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana li We did not reveal this Qur'an upon you to cause you distress. SubhanAllah, this is not the purpose of the revelation of the Qur'an. Illa tathkiratan liman yakhsha. This is a reminder for people of awe, people of humility, people of khashya. إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى تَنْزِيلًا مِمَّنْ خَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ الْعُلَىٰ الرَّحْمَانُ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ استوى. This is the words of Surah Taha, subhanAllah, are so powerful and they apply so perfectly to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of that which is observable and that which is not observable. الرحمن, once again, the most merciful, send it upon his throne. لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا وَمَا تَحْتَ الثَّرَى وَإِن تَجْهَرْ بِالْقَوْلِ If you speak your words or if you keep them to yourself, Allah knows that which is hidden and that which is even less than that which is hidden. Allah knows what is said, what is not said, and even beyond, even beneath what is not said. Allah knows all of it. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as he's reading it, he comes to this realization. He says, "Ma atiyab hadh al kalam wahsana." Beautiful words these are. How perfect are these words? Ma atiyab hadh al kalam. Like I'm reading with, with 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 clear mind and clear heart right now. And I'm just appreciating the words. Ma atiyab hadh al kalam wahsana. And he keeps on reading until he gets to. And Subhanallah, I just think about the the words that he stopped at. In nani an Allah. لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدني وأقيم الصلاة لذكري. Like you know when you read the Quran, you're supposed to read it as a message to you. إنني أنا الله. I am Allah. Speaking to Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه. إنني أنا الله. لا إله إلا أنا. There is no god but me. فاعبدني. So worship me alone. وأقيم الصلاة لذكري. And establish the prayer out of my remembrance. Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه said. The one who spoke these words has the right to have no one worship besides him. This ilah should have no one worshipped besides him. He's reading it as if it is being revealed to him. He puts it down. He says, Min hadha farrat Quraysh? SubhanAllah, like look at all the, the, the self-reflection and realization that this is what Quraysh is running away from? <laughs> this is the evil that Quraysh is afraid of? This is what Quraysh hates so much. This is why Abu Jahl is persecuting these people. This is why I've been persecuting people. Min hadha farrat Quraysh. This is what we're running away from. But this is beautiful. Why would we run away from this? 
So as Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is coming to that realization, Khabbab radiallahu anhu finally comes out. He's been hiding the whole time, listening to the, the, the violence, listening to the conversations, and Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes out. And he says, Abshir ya Umar, bi karamatillah. Glad tidings to, to you, O Umar, with the generosity of Allah. Umar goes, Antil Qari, you were the one that was reading when I first got to the door, like, wait a minute, let's establish what's happening here first, right? He says, Abshir ya Umar bi karamatillah. And he says, he said to him, I was the one reciting, and he says, Wa inni arju an takuna qad sabaqat fika da'watu Rasulillah. And I hope that the dua of the Prophet has been accepted in regards to you. For I heard him say, Allahumma a'izza al-Islam bi ahabbi hadayn al-rajulayn ilayk Umar ibn al-Khattab aw Amr ibn Hisham. O oh Allah, give victory to Islam. Would the more beloved of these two men to you, Amr ibn Hisham, Abu Jahl, Amr ibn Hisham or Umar ibn al-Khattab, one of the two Umars, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Can you imagine when he just hears that the Prophet ﷺ was making dua that the more beloved to Allah of the two will be the one upon whose hand Islam will be given victory? Now Umar and Abu Jahl were very similar in their stature, in their intelligence, in their leadership skills, their size, all of that. Umar radiallahu anhu, a lot younger, less vicious. But the Prophet ﷺ saw hope in both of them. He said, the one that's more beloved to you, O oh Allah. Umar radiallahu anhu says, Awaqat qala dhalika Rasulullah. He said, Did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa really say that? Khabab radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Yes, wallahi, O Umar, he said that. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, At that moment, ma fil ardi nasamatun ahabba ilayya min Rasulullah. SubhanAllah, at that moment, there was no person in the world more beloved to me than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like, I went out to kill this man, alayhi salatu wa salam, and right now, there is no person in the world that was more beloved to me. Then the Prophet ﷺ, So I said, where is the Messenger of Allah? Take me to him, I'm going to become Muslim. Fatima radiallahu anha said, Ya ibn al-Khattab, do you promise not to bring to him anything that displeases him? He says, no, I, I, I promise. I promise my sister, I'm being sincere, I want to go and become Muslim. So Khabbab takes him to Dar al-Arqam. He gets to Dar al-Arqam. Umar ibn al-Khattab knocks on the door. Umar does not hide in society. He just walks through the streets, by the way. He's not afraid of anybody. Walks with his sword still with him. Why does he still have a sword with him? Because he was going to kill the Prophet He goes to Dar al-Arqam and he knocks on the door. A man looks out and they don't have the ring app back then or anything like, but he sees Umar radiallahu anhu at the door. This is the nightmare scenario of them all because if there was anyone that would, that would just kill them all and not care about consequences, it was Umar radiallahu anhu, right? So when he sees that, he immediately panics. And he says, Hada Umar, Hada Umar, this is Umar, this is Umar, he has his sword. Guess who's sitting there amongst them that wasn't sitting with them before? Hamza radiallahu anhu. The words of Hamza, sometimes it's cool when the fusha sounds a lot like the modern day. He says, Malakum, <laughs> like Malakum, what's your problem? He's completely relaxed, as if nothing is happening right now. They said, Umar bin al-Khattab, and he's coming and he has his sword with him. He said, Wa in kana Umar, so what if he's Umar? Hamza says, open the door. He says, if he wants good, then Allah will receive him with good. And if he's come with some other intention, then I will kill him with my own sword. I'll separate his head from his body. Hamza, Hamza says, let Umar in. I'm not worried about him. So this is a new development because they weren't used to having a Hamza amongst them, right? In that sense. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, go ahead and let him in. If Allah wants good for him, then Allah will guide him. SubhanAllah, when they open the door for Umar, does Hamza apprehend Umar? No. The Prophet ﷺ goes up to Umar and he grabs him with both of his hands and he starts to shake his garment and he brings him to his knees. SubhanAllah, Rasulullah ﷺ himself. This is a strange sight for the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ grabs him and he pulls him to his knees and he says, ما جاء بك يا ابن الخطاب. He's speaking to him harshly. What brought you here, O oh, Ibn al-Khattab? Ma anta bi muntahin hatta yunzil Allahu bika qari'a? Are you not going to stop until Allah sends a lightning bolt or some sort of disaster upon you? What is your problem? When are you going to wake up, O oh, Umar? Like this is tough love from the Prophet to Umar radiallahu anhu. And this isn't Hamza. This is the Prophet himself. And Umar radiallahu anhu was brought to his knees 
And Umar was such a big man that when he's brought to his knees, you're eye to eye with him. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, jittuka liyumina billahi wa bi rasulihi wa bima ja'a min indillah. Ya Rasulullah, I've come to you to believe in Allah and to believe in the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what he has brought from Allah Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka Rasulullah Right away I testify to the oneness of Allah and that you are the Messenger of Allah What was the response of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam immediately grabbed him again put him on the ground, <laughs> shook him, received him this way This whole scene is so strange to the Muslims What is happening here, right? And Umar radiallahu anhu immediately submits himself Take shahada, the Prophet ﷺ says, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. He says Allahu Akbar. So what does everyone do? They all shout Allahu Akbar, forgetting that they were in a hidden home in Mecca. They used to try to keep their voices down in Dar al-Arqam. They all shout Allahu Akbar because they realize that Umar anhu just became Muslim. So all these Muslims in Dar al-Arqam start to shout Allahu Akbar. The Prophet ﷺ, he puts his hand on his chest, he struck his chest three times and he says, Allahumma ayyid deenik, deenika bibn al-Khattab, Allahumma akhraj ma, ma fi sadrihi min ghillin wa abdilhu imana. Oh Allah, support your deen with ibn al-Khattab and oh Allah, take away anything from his heart that remains of malice and switch it, exchange it with iman. Exchange it with iman. In one narration, Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhu says, Lama aslama Umar. When Umar ta'ala anhu became Muslim, Nazal Jibreel. Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, laqad istabshara ahlu sama bi islami Umar. The inhabitants of the heavens right now are celebrating the Islam of Umar. All of the Sahaba are saying Allahu Akbar. And Jibreel alayhi salam tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, all of the angels in the heavens are also praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine the angels in the heavens, all of the inhabitants of the heavens saying Allahu Akbar. Because they know that what just happened is no small deal. Now, by the way, an important detail. Umar's Islam came just three days after Hamza. SubhanAllah, changes things a bit, right? Three days after Hamza. May Allah be pleased with him. So when Hamza became Muslim, radiallahu anhu, that was one boost, right? Now Umar becomes Muslim radiallahu anhu three days after Hamza. At the same time, Amr ibn As just got back from Abyssinia, having failed to bring back the migrants from Abyssinia. So he failed with the Muslims in Abyssinia. He comes back to Mecca. The news is Umar and Hamza just became Muslim. He's arriving at the exact same time as Umar and Hamza became Muslim. So this is a complete, in a matter of three days, a complete game changer. Umar radiallahu anhu says there were 39 men in Islam and I was the 40th person, the 40th man to embrace Islam. So here is Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed after the Islam of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, idfa' billati hi ahsan. Fa'idha ladhi baynaka wa baynahu adawatun ka'annahu waliyun hameen. The verse in Fussilat that respond to that which is evil with that which is better, and you will find, you will find that those who are, have enmity with you will be like your closest friends. They'll become your allies. They'll go from being your enemies to your allies. The ulama say that this was the celebration of Hamza and the Bushra of Umar. The glad tidings that someone even bigger than Hamza is about to become Muslim. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu became Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ was he not dead? And we gave him light by which he walks amongst life, by which he walks with a light amongst the people. Like Umar radiallahu anhu was a walking dead man amongst you. And Allah gave him life. And now imagine a person with light walking amongst the people. What does that look like? What that looks like is Umar radiallahu anhu, as soon as he becomes Muslim and the Muslims are saying Allahu Akbar, Umar radiallahu anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, alasna ala al-haqq, aren't we upon the truth? Whether we die or whether we live, aren't we upon the truth? The Prophet ﷺ says, yes. And he says, and aren't they upon falsehood? He's already speaking the language of us and they. Okay? And aren't they upon falsehood? The Prophet ﷺ says, yes. Umar said, then why are we hiding? Let's go out there and proclaim our Islam. This is where it gets very interesting, by the way. And this was the day, by the way, that the Prophet ﷺ called him Al-Faruq. That day. 
The one فرق الله به بين الحق والباطل. Allah, الفاروق is the uh, you know the one who the, the barrier, the one who decides, the differentiator between truth and falsehood. الفاروق is Umar رضي الله عنه. He's like a barrier between falsehood and truth. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, you know what? Let's go out and proclaim our Islam. This will be the first time. Hamza رضي الله عنه just became Muslim. Umar رضي الله عنه became Muslim. Suddenly. These two strong men are now Muslim. You know what? Let's go out and let's declare our Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ would arrange the Muslims in two rows, one behind Hamza, one behind Umar, and they go out marching, doing tasbih and tahleel and takbir, proclaiming their Islam, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, declaring the oneness of Allah, and they're standing behind Umar and Hamza. No one's going to touch them. When Umar and Hamza, may Allah be pleased with them, are the ones leading the two rows. On top of that, Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he's not satisfied. He wants a little bit of confrontation. They're not doing anything. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, who's the person in society that can't hold water in his mouth? Meaning, who's the big mouth in society? I want the news to spread quicker that I became Muslim. So they said, oh, that's Jamil ibn Mu'ammar. He said, let me go to Jamil ibn Mu'ammar. So he goes to Jamil ibn Mu'ammar and he says, hey, Aslamt, I became Muslim. Jamil jumps up and he goes to the cabin, he starts screaming to everyone in society, and he says that Ya Quraysh, Umar Aqad Saba, Umar Aqad Saba, Umar has apostated, Umar has apostated. And Umar radiallahu anhu says, Hey, you're lying, Aslamt. I said I became Muslim, not apostated. But the point is, is that the, the word is getting out and people already know. So here's what Umar radiallahu anhu wanted. All of these men come out from Quraysh and they start to attack Umar. Umar had a field day with them. He started to beat them up one by one. Starts laying them up, uh, laying them out all over the ground. And Umar radiallahu anhu is doing this for hours until Umar radiallahu anhu gets a little bit tired of just beating people up at this point. No one was able to get him down. Umar radiallahu anhu is beating them up one by one around the Kaaba. And then Umar says, I got tired. So he took Utbah bin uh, Rabi'ah, who was of course uh, an enemy of the Prophet sallallahu Umar radiallahu anhu pinned him to the ground and then he sat on him and Umar put his fingers in his eyes. Exactly. Okay. He put his two fingers in his eyes. And Umar said to Utbah, tell your men to back off or I'm going to pluck your eyes out. So Utbah is screaming and saying, irji'u, irji'u, get away from him, get away from him. And Umar radiallahu anhu is poking at his two eyes, clawing his eyes. And Umar radiallahu anhu takes a break after beating up these men for hours. And then, you know, they gather up some steam again and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is ready to go for round two at this point. And as that's about to happen, a man comes forth and he is in a fine thawb, a hulla, which is like a, a silk suit of the time. And he says to them, what are you people doing? He says, look, the man chose a religion for himself and that's his business. Leave him alone. He says, if you keep fighting him or if you kill him, then Banu Adi will come after you and we're never going to be able to stop this. So everyone go home, enough. So everyone dispersed. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, I asked my father, who was that man? And he said, that was Al-As ibn Wa'id, the father of Amr, Al-As ibn Wa'id. So he was a respected man that was able to disperse the crowds at that point. Umar radiallahu anhu, still not satisfied. Umar radiallahu anhu said, so I thought to myself, who is the person that hates the Prophet ﷺ most, his biggest enemy in society, the person who would be most, most bothered by me being Muslim. He said, my uncle, Abu Jahl. So instead of waiting for Abu Jahl to come to him, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes and he knocks on the door of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl comes out and says, marhaban wa ahlan. He welcomes him. And he says, nephew, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, right? And the last conversation they had was that Umar was going to be the one to kill the Prophet ﷺ and receive the gift, the bounty from Abu Jahl. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says to him, I want you to know, amantu billahi wa rasuli. I'm just here to tell you, I believe in Allah and his messenger was saddaqta ma ja'a bihi. And I have, I, 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 I have affirmed everything that he has brought. Abu Jahl said, la taf'al, don't do it. He said, too late. He said, don't do it. He said, too late. So, so, so Umar radiallahu anhu said, Abu Jahl slammed the door in, in my face and he said, like what a horrible thing that you brought to me. And he said, leave me alone, go away. Basically cursed him out and said, leave me alone. This is the beginning of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Islam. 
Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu has probably the most powerful statement in this regard about the significance of this conversion of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the early days of Islam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah. He says, Inna Islam Umar kana fathan wa kanat hijratuhu nasran wa kanat imaratuhu rahmah. He said the Islam of Umar was a conquest in and of itself. It was victory. When Umar became Muslim, it changed everything. Remember Abdullah bin Mas'ud was the first one to recite Quran publicly and almost was killed for it. And he was of the weak of society. He said when Umar became Muslim, SubhanAllah, that day of Islam was a victory. It was as if it was a conquest in and of itself. And his hijrah was a victory. And his leadership was a mercy. His leadership was a mercy. Why? Because Umar radiallahu anhu upheld the rights of who? The weak and the oppressed under his Khilafah. His Khilafah is the noted Khilafah of justice for those who were weak and those who were oppressed. And he said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتَنَا I remember the days. وَمَا نَسْتَطِيعُ أَن نُصَلِّيَ بِالْبَيْتِ حَتَّى أَسْلَمَ عُمَرْ فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ عُمَرْ قَاتَلَهُمْ حَتَّى تَرَكُونَا فَصَلَّيْنَا He said that I remember the days we could not go and pray in front of the Kaaba. When Umar became Muslim, we'd go out and we'd pray and Umar would beat the people up until we would be left alone and we could pray. Like no one would come near us because Umar would fight them off and we would be able to pray. So he's remembering those days of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Suhaib al-Rumi, he says, we used to never be able to congregate in public as Muslims. No two Muslims could even be in public. But he said, after Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we started to congregate, we started to pray, we started to do tawaf. And he said, and when they hit us, we hit back. So subhanAllah, the consequences of the Islam of one person, which was Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a man, subhanAllah, who set out to kill the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ended up being in front of the Prophet Sallallahu as a believer. And the Prophet Sallallahu marching behind him as Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu leads the way and opens the door for Islam. A man subhanAllah who set out to kill the Prophet Sallallahu and ended up being buried next to him. A man who they said his father's donkey would become Muslim before him. And here he was, and Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala answered the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and gave Izza to Islam through the Islam of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Just in a few minutes, I know we're a few minutes past Isha, I'll go ahead and I will wrap up. At this point now, you have Hamza and you have Umar, may Allah be pleased with them. And that's where you start to see now the boycott. Abu Jahl has to resort to different ways to hurt the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So choking them out, Banu Hashim and Banu Mutalib, through the economic boycott, uh, the persecution is not like it used to be because it wasn't just Bilal's and Khabbab's now. It was Umar's and Hamza's at this point. They could not just go, and it wasn't just fair game to go and attack Muslims in public anymore. So they had to think of different ways to persecute and to make things more difficult on the Muslims. But now the physical strength was different. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu describes the hijrah which came a few years later. And he said, مَا عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ أَحَدًا مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ هَاجَرْ إِلَّا مُخْتَفِيًا He said, I don't know of anyone that made hijrah except that they concealed their hijrah. He said, except for Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, you know what Umar did on the day of the hijrah? People were trying to sneak out and hide. He said, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu on the day of his hijrah, he went out openly with his sword and with his bow. He went to the Kaaba and he calmly made tawaf seven times around the Kaaba. And he prayed two rak'ahs after he made his tawaf. And after he prayed, calmly took his time, not worried about anyone trying to come after him. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, went to all of them in Quraysh. He went to their groups, he went to their leaders, he went to their faces, he says, Shahat al wujuh you humiliated faces, who Allah will humiliate, who Allah has declared as a humiliated people. And he says, Man arada an yathkula ummahu, aw yurammil zawjatahu, aw yuyattam waladahu. Whoever wants that his mother would cry over him or his wife would become a widow, or his children would be orphaned, he said, فَلْيُلْقِنِي وَرَاءَ هَذَا الْوَادِ Come meet me behind the valley. Basically, let's have one last brawl before I leave Mecca. And he's going to them and he's saying, is anyone going to come? And he spent some time threatening them, saying, you guys want to come fight? 
And subhanAllah, only some of the mustad'afeen, some of the weak people, they followed Umar radiallahu anhu behind the valley and they said, we don't want to fight you, can you teach us what you've learned? We want to join you. And so they became Muslim. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had the largest group of people when he made the hijrah to al Madina, And they did not fear for themselves, subhanAllah. They were over 20 people walking, making the hijrah, making the migration to al Madina with Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in their presence. And they did not fear for themselves when Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was amongst them. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu brought a strength to the Muslims that was not there before. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu from that day forward, his conversion was not just the most consequential conversion in the history of Islam. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu took every negative quality that he had and turned it into a positive quality. And that's the genius of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The most successful teskia experiment that you will find. A person who gives you no excuses. He took his cruelty prior to Islam and turned it into mercy and justice for the weak and for those who were poor. He took his anger and he channeled it towards righteousness. He took his strength and he channeled it towards righteousness. He became humble, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When the Prophet spoke, he humbled himself. He was a man who would cry and pray at night, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was charitable. Everything that would have been negative as a result of his strength, he turned it into positive. And he is Al-Farooq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he is a man who stands out first and foremost with his sincerity. And inshallah ta'ala, the next time, we will talk about his virtues radiallahu ta'ala anhu. To cover the seerah of Umar would take too long. We will talk about his virtues inshallah ta'ala and parallel that to his life radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we'll see where it takes us from there bi ta'ala. So with that inshallah ta'ala, because we are already 10 minutes past Salat al-Isha, we will go ahead and stop tonight without any questions. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.